Hi, I'm Becky Sanders. I'm the Program Director for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. Thank you for joining us today for our Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center webinar series. Um, today we have with us Marie Lee from Henry Ford Health System. Um, and Marie's going to talk about what they've been doing uh, around school-based health and um, give us some examples of how they've enabled their virtual care for kiddos at school. So without further ado, Marie, I'm going to hand things over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Becky. And just uh, as a note of uh, housekeeping, if there are questions, are we asking participants to put them in the chat and you're interrupting as appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so please use the chat for technical questions only. Please use the Q&A for any questions um, that you want to direct towards Marie. I will be watching those as we go through the webinar today and we'll interrupt her if necessary, but then probably leave most of the questions until the end of the presentation today. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. So hopefully you will find this valuable. Let me go ahead and see if I can get my slides to advance now. Okay. Again, my name is Marie and I am a virtual care consultant with Henry Ford Health System. I've been with the health system since 2007, started as a training coordinator for the contact center, which was our centralized appointment scheduling hub for many of our systems providers. Um, from there, I transitioned to the team that rolled out our electronic medical record system. We use Epic. So I was really part of that team that looked at that front end scheduling piece for outpatient. From there, I actually transitioned into virtual care, which is a pretty interesting culmination of a lot of the different things I've done in my career. I actually started in telecommunications, so it worked out very nicely to marry that technical aspect with the health system experience that I had. Henry Ford Health System is located uh, primarily in southeastern Michigan, and while we are located in more of a, an urban area, we certainly share a lot of the challenges uh, that the rural health systems have as well. Uh, certainly we have challenges in terms of families uh, having access to care, having access to technology, and certainly transportation. All of those things really still hold true even in that urban area. From a virtual care standpoint, Henry Ford has, has set out a digital mission to provide an exceptional digital experience, enabling customers to engage with Henry, Health, Henry Ford Health System where, when, and how they prefer. And from a virtual care standpoint, and I think that this is probably even more important now as we are dealing with shelter in place and, and the after effects of COVID, is that we're evolving innovative care delivery to enhance the health and wellness through accessible technology that drives connection and collaboration where, when, and how it's needed most. And I think really the emphasis being on connection and collaboration because we didn't want to lose access to our patients and our patients really were fearful of coming in but still needed that connection to their provider. So super important as I'm sure all of you have experienced exponential growth in your virtual care. Today, we want to talk a little bit about how we've addressed the barriers and limited access for primary care and behavioral health services for our K through 12 students. Take a look at how we could use exam enabled devices to expand coverage for our medical care using limited provider resources, but again, still having that ability to do an exam. Increasing patient and parent caregiver participation, satisfaction and convenience using virtual technologies. And of course, it would be difficult to have a presentation today without talking about COVID-19 and how that really changed the landscape for our programs. Our school-based community health program really set out to address the needs of mental and physical health for our students to really contribute to their, their success in schools. And our health centers strive to provide that comprehensive, interdisciplinary, and confidential health service that will meet the needs of students in a place where they're comfortable and hopefully going every day. Although again, post COVID, that landscape has changed a little bit. We have a team approach to care. These are experts in pediatric and school-based care. And one of the advantages of being part of a larger health system is that anything that requires follow-up, perhaps with a list or maybe some additional uh, means of care, we have the ability or our providers have the ability to seek out that care 
and get those consultations very quickly within the health system and, and get those students connected to the care that they need. Uh, the team for school-based health includes those medical assistants, nurses, nurse practitioners, clinical therapists, and physicians. And it really enables us to give personalized treatment to the students. We cover a wide range of services, including that primary care and behavioral health. And I think where, where some of this is particularly important, obviously it connects students to care where they might have difficulty either in terms of getting to the doctor or maybe financial. Uh, it gives them that quick, easy access, but things like immunizations, they can get right at school. Uh, things like health education, they get right in that, within that clinical setting, but even more sensitive things like the HIV or pregnancy testing, they can get that confidential service without having to go and seek that care. So they're getting quicker access to care where maybe if that wasn't available within the school, um, they wouldn't be able to get that. And then of course, behavioral health services, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, but those have been very scarce resources. And certainly there's a lot, of, um, a lot of stigma around behavioral health services. And so having that within the schools is very helpful. Taking a look at trends in, in child well-being, and I'm sure that this is reflective of a lot of different areas as well, but certainly in the city of Detroit, we look at children in poverty based on who is receiving free and reduced lunches. So the bar graph on the right of the screen looks at uh, 2012 and then 2017 as snapshots. And while those, those graphs are trending down for 2017, and then again, kind of continuing on, you're still seeing very high poverty rates in the, in the city of Detroit and then in the counties that we serve, specifically Wayne County and Macomb County, where we have our school-based health clinics. So there's definitely a need and there's definitely uh, significant poverty in those areas. Looking at our school-based health by the numbers, again, we have 14 clinics. Most of them are located within Wayne County, and a lot of them are located within the city of Detroit, but we do have some that are located a little bit further out in our Macomb County areas, and we are able to service, again, those additional clinics within the school area where we can get those vaccinations, those well checks, those mental health visits right within the context of that clinic in the school. One of the big challenges that, again, I'm sure a lot of you are facing as well are just the extreme shortage in behavioral health services across the board, but then specifically looking at child and adolescent psychiatric care within the state of Michigan, specifically in the lower peninsula and the lower half of that lower peninsula, that's where we're seeing the most extreme shortage of providers, specifically, again, within that, that tri-county area where that southeastern Michigan area where Henry Ford has its primary footprint. And so it's been challenging, again, even in this urban area to get access to care. So what that means, obviously, long wait times to even get in to see a provider. And then when there is an availability for a provider in a clinical setting, transportation issues become huge because quite often those, those visits or those physicians are, are quite a distance from where that child is located. So super important to look at ways in which we can bring those into a setting where they have easy access. Specifically looking at our challenges, so even as we were looking at our school-based health program, we were still dealing with very limited resources. In the schools, we had MAs or nurses, and then we had those clinical therapists at every school. What we didn't have the opportunity to provide would be behavioral health, a psychiatrist, as well as that higher level medical coverage. In our case, we're using NPs to cover all the clinics. So the logistics then become, how do we get that provider physically to see all of those, those students that need care if we're having a provider travel from clinic to clinic, then that takes away that windshield time is now time that they can't see someone in the clinic. And also, if we're moving a clinician from one clinic to another, it means maybe we don't have the right coverage for our students in all of the clinics at, at all times. Thinking also from a student standpoint, we did have care. So again, our, our psychiatrist was provided to our school-based health clinics two times a month. 
So each month, the, the clinician would be physically in one of two locations. So one, you know, one week it would be in one location and then two weeks later it would be in a different location because those were the schools where we had the av availability and, and room for that clinician to see students, which meant we're transporting students from other schools to where the clinician was. So that travel time is, was long, taking students out of school, the logistics of transporting the students was one thing, but really the second piece was when parents needed to be present for those visits, especially in talking about medication review and changing medications, it was very, very difficult, if not impossible for parents to travel to that remote location. So all of these things were, were significant challenges just for us in, in terms of how do we address that? Well, gee, virtual care sounds like an option so that we can be in all of those places with our limited resources. Our school-based school community health program is affiliated with our Community Health Alliance of Michigan, as well as the national organization, our school-based health alliance. How do we get the money for this? Well, it's grant funded. Our students will never pay out of pocket. They do not pay co-pays. They do not pay any balances. There's no testing, no fees ever go to the, the student or the, the parent. When available, if the child is covered by insurance, we do bill the insurance and try to get reimbursement if that's possible. And when it's not, we're, we're looking to, again, different grant funding resources to cover those costs. Henry Ford Health System also supplies not only personnel, but uh, funding to this program as well. So it's incredibly important to our community. It's really part of our, um, our commitment to the community to make sure that everyone has access to care and that we're able to provide this. So we do partner a lot with the state of Michigan and alternately other funding sources to ensure that we can keep running this program within the schools. So taking a look at the medical portion, when a student needs some sort of medical care, whether it's routine care or even urgent care, we have clinics within the school. So this is definitely a, a step above the nurse's office. This is, this is actually a functioning clinic within the space that the school, schools have provided for us. Each clinic has a nurse and a clinical therapist. And when a, when a student comes in and needs that care or needs that overview of a nurse practitioner, again, speaking specifically for the medical piece, then we can connect to that nurse practitioner. So we're, we're really built, our virtual care is built on a hub and spoke kind of a concept. And when the student checks in with the, the clinic, they're roomed by that nurse or that MA, get the vitals taken, all that information is entered into to the electronic medical record system. And then at the appropriate time, we can go ahead and contact the nurse practitioner. And we'll talk about how that nurse practitioner is actually able to do an exam. As far as benefits, this is, this is kind of a no-brainer, right? If we keep students healthy, uh, their, their attendance is gonna be improved. If their attendance is improved, we're gonna see higher graduation rates. And it, specifically in the state or in the city of Detroit, we've had traditionally lots of issues with school funding because of lack of attendance or high truancy rates. So again, the more ways in which we can make sure that students are in school and healthy, we're gonna see greater student productivity and staff productivity because there's less interruptions. And then we can better treat students with complex health issues because we don't just have a nurse in the school. We have the ability for them to see a provider who can do that higher level of care for those students. And things especially like asthma that can cause lots and lots of issues for students if they're not on a medication regimen and if they're not following up appropriately and if they don't know how to use their medications or their inhalers, those types of things are, are relatively simple uh, if we can deal with them on an ongoing basis, but if there's not access to care, it becomes a much more critical type of a situation and causes those students to lose time in school. One of the big challenges, of course, is how do you treat a student in a clinical setting without that parent. 
so it was really important for the program to determine, gee, if we can get parental consent right up front, let them know we have this clinical setting in the school. If we can get that consent right up front, then we can go ahead and treat those students throughout the school year without any disruptions to care. So we try to hit those those parents in multiple ways. Of course, you know, you're not going to just hand a piece of paper to somebody one time and go, yay, we're going to get that signature and get it back. So we're trying to hit those parents in multiple ways throughout the school year, but starting at the beginning of the school year and even before the school starts, school year starts, we're getting them in welcome packets. We're doing it uh, via classroom dis distribution. We're hitting them in houses, student registrations, health fairs, basically any point of contact that we will have with that that student and their family, we want to try to get that consent form signed and back to the school. And again, once it's signed, we can put that in the electronic medical record. We can see that it's there and, and we can go ahead and actually care for those students. This is just a quick review of the from the medical side and again, behavioral health, the services and treatments. So we're seeing a lot of asthma. We're seeing a lot of cold and flu, basic things like pink eye, sore throats, uh, you know, nausea and vomiting, those, those sorts of things, even minor injuries like sprains and strains. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the behavioral health services in a little bit. So again, how do we do this? Really how we're doing this is utilizing Tito Care. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a minute. And Becky has got the, uh, I know Becky's got the video up for me. So Tito Care is, is what allows us to do that exam. So there's just a quick video I want to show that kind of explains and gives a really good overview of that. All right. Telehealth is here, but is a call or video conference enough? Can clinicians make an accurate diagnosis without an in-person physical exam? Now they can with TitoCare. TitoCare has two new telehealth solutions that help ensure a remote diagnosis is the right diagnosis. Tito Pro for clinicians and Tito Home for patients. Both solutions include the TitoCare device and a complete telehealth platform for those that need it. Tito Pro, designed for clinicians, captures and records comprehensive exam data and facilitates the sharing of results between health professionals in remote locations. With its easy to use touch screen, Tito Pro is an all-in-one digital stethoscope, otoscope, camera, and thermometer. It delivers high resolution, clinical quality video and images of the ears, throat, skin, audio of the heart, lung, and abdomen, and records temperatures and heart rate. With Tito Pro, you can extend medical services to remote locations such as home visits, employer work sites, schools, and urgent care clinics. Capture, store, and forward exam results, or conduct an exam in real time for an immediate diagnosis. Get a quick second opinion for specialist consult. And link exam results to your patient's EHR for continuity of care and symptom tracking. In the office, Tito Pro can be used to share images with patients to explain a diagnosis and motivate treatment. Tito Home offers all the exam capabilities of Tito Pro, but is designed for patient use with smart guidance technology so your patients can easily gather and send in all the exam data you need for a more informed and accurate diagnosis. All from the comfort of home. Now you can extend your medical practice beyond the walls of your office to wherever your patients are making the promise of telehealth a reality. With TitoCare, health is in your hands. Great, thank you so much for showing that. I'm gonna get back to sharing my screen. Get back. So Tito Care, again, we, we determined that Tito Care was going to be a great resource for us to be able to extend those limited services of the NPs that we had, and so that we could service effectively all of our clinics with just a couple of NPs and make sure that we're covering everybody. Uh, F, it, Tito Care was FDA cleared in 2017, and a lot of people across the globe and across the U.S. are utilizing this. Again, we are utilizing the Tito Pro for this particular application. Just quickly to review, 
uh, the device itself, and you saw in the video and you see in the example here with the person's hand, the device itself is maybe as big as a softball. And it's very, very intuitive. It, it walks through from the patient end exactly where uh, that device should be placed. It looks at, and it, it walks through again what, what devices should be plugged in for the exam that the provider is looking for. And additionally, I think some of the, some of the more important devices are actually Bluetooth enabled. Uh, in terms of thinking about the school-based health, that blood pressure cuff and the weight are very important, especially when we're looking at medications and the, the effects or the side effects that we could be having on a student. And then certainly in light of COVID, the pulse oximeter, very important too, to make sure that we've got good oxygen flow. And again, we're, we're dealing with a lot of patients who have asthma issues. So those peripheral devices, additionally important. Um, to give that clinician more of a feel for what's happening real time with that student. And they can hear and, and see. The only thing that they really can't get and, and the only, I guess, complaint that, that the clinicians have is that they can't palpate on the uh, student's abdomen. Uh, but again, they can walk through uh, how to do that or they can basically ask a lot of questions because there is a clinical person with the student walking through that exam as well. So looking at psychiatry or telepsychiatry, again, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here that obviously mental health works really well over virtual care. And it's definitely an approach to extend the reach of those very limited psychiatry resources and fill those gaps in care. The convenience of having those mental health appointments in the schools, in the schools which is their Again, where the students often are very comfortable, uh, they sometimes feel more comfortable in a school setting even than their home setting. Uh, there could be a lot of different things going on at, at home that maybe school is the safer place. And they're seeing people that they see on an everyday basis. They're seeing that, that clinical therapist who's in the school who maybe they've seen for other things prior. They're seeing that school nurse. They're seeing the front desk person who works at the clinic. And so those are all very comforting. And when they need to see that psychiatrist, it's a much less anxiety filled uh, kind of an encounter. Uh, and, and it really reduces the stigma associated with mental health services. And we can really increase that continuity of care because now we've got the medical care and the behavioral health care really all in one, and we're able to, to fully care for that child and coordinate the care between all those different providers. Looking at infrastructure, when we looked at how to roll this out, so moving away from that situation where the provider was physically in the clinic and we were transporting students to that provider, we were looking at an opportunity so that that, again, mirroring what was happening on the medical side where we had that hub and spoke format, we wanted to make sure, or actually one of the nice things about the schools is that they were already connected to our, our internal network. So they already had that connection, not only to our network, but to our electronic medical record system. Again, we're an Epic shop. And when we were looking at the connections for the video or the audio and video portion, we were looking at things that were, again, met all the security requirements and were HIPAA compliant, those types of things. Equipment was pretty standard. We're not looking at anything, again, specifically speaking about behavioral health, we weren't looking for anything beyond audio and video. So if we had a web camera or if we had a laptop that was equipped, that was pretty easy. Uh, it became a little bit more challenging when we wanted to make sure that the equipment accommodated multiple people, uh, when it was a patient and family, uh, and that we had to look at the opportunity to be able to bring in interpreter services. And um, in a lot of cases, our families are in areas, or our schools are in areas where families do not necessarily speak English. Uh, students speak English very well, but when you're bringing in a parent, we want to make sure that they understand what's happening as well. So integrating those interpreter services as part of that video connection also became very, very important for us. Just a, a again, no-brainer. Even though we're in an urban area, 
it's still pretty, the distance between where the provider is at and where the schools are at can be pretty lengthy. And while 36 miles in 40 minutes doesn't really sound like a lot, it, it obviously adds up. If it's 40 miles one way, that's, that's almost an entire session for a new patient that that psychiatrist would be, could be using to see another patient. So again, by keeping the provider in one spot, and then connecting to the various schools. Obviously, we're saving a lot of time and giving the opportunity for the provider to see more patients. The way we handle that in EPIC is that we do include the name of the school in the notes field so that we know what the patient's home clinic is. That becomes important for the psychiatrist so that she knows who she's connected, first of all, and who that, that therapist is in that particular school. And then, of course, who to contact if there's not ever some sort of technical issue, those kinds of things. So it's pretty helpful in the notes to know that. And typically, they're scheduling appointments at a certain set of, of schools on a particular day. So we're managing our access in a way that we're, we're focusing on a set of schools. In, in addition to that two days where we were focusing on a set of schools, that added the additional four. So it was five schools one day, five schools another day, that covered the, the two days that she had FTE for us. Uh, we added a third day so that it would accommodate the four additional schools that had gotten added last year to the behavioral health program. Obviously, again, seeing these patients in person would have been incredibly prohibitive and looking for ways to reduce the no-shows, especially when the parents need to be present for the visit. This is just a quick bar graph of what happened in 2019. October shows the spike in visits where we added the third day for our clinician to see those patients. So this is just a snapshot of, of the growth over 2019. Some of the challenges in providing that telepsychiatry and uh, re reiterating again and again and again, uh, huge, shortages in terms of providers that can see patients. And, and again, even within our own health system, the fact that we can only provide a clinician for now three days a month, it's very limited in terms of what we're able to, to carve out of, of that clinician schedule. Initial and ongoing funding, always, always an issue, and we're always looking at opportunities to increase funding and or to at least maintain the funding that we have. The equipment costs were pretty minimal as the clinicians and all the locations had equipment already. So when we're looking at students in a school, that issue, yeah, it's not as big, but when we start moving students now away from the schools because they haven't been at school because of the COVID crisis, that becomes a whole different discussion. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Proper Wi-Fi access, one of the interesting challenges that we hadn't really thought about was that the private space within those clinics within the schools uh, it was it was challenging in some cases to find a place where we could have that student behind close where other people weren't hearing what was going on well that solution in many cases was an interior functionally closet or storage space and a lot of the schools are conduct are constructed in that cinder block kind of a kind of a way. And so Wi-Fi in those rooms was very, very spotty at best. And when we looked at opportunities to increase the Wi-Fi in those rooms, uh, you know, you think, oh gee, why can't we just uh, wire something or new access point? Well, you couldn't get into those rooms because of drilling through uh, potentially caused all sorts of issues with asbestos. And there were just a lot of infrastructure issues that we hadn't really anticipated. So those were really challenging for our IT department to make sure that we had access in these little cubbies, basically, that were ca carved out for these confidential spaces. And considering how small these spaces are and thinking about how we're supposed to be maintaining social distance, this is gonna be a challenge even if and when those students go back to school bringing the parents in and having them in the same room as the therapist connecting to that distant provider, it's going to be challenging. And in some cases, we may actually have to have the parent and family in one room, the therapist in another, and then everybody connecting via video. 
um, even though physically we're in the same building. So it's going to be very interesting logistics and challenging uh, to, to meet all of those, those requirements. Um, vital signs need to be taken at every visit. In most cases, when physically in school, not a problem because we can get those uh, because they're being roomed kind of like they would be in any other situation. Although in some schools, the behavioral health portion um, or that confidential room was physically across the building from where the medical clinic was. So that in some schools was, was a challenge. How do we get the patient checked in, get their vital signs, and then get them moved over to where they're seeing the, um, the psychiatrist? No-shows, still an issue. Um, not as big of an issue when we're not moving the, the student from one place to another, but certainly students don't show up to school sometimes. And then getting those parents or guardians to show up, even though they're potentially or hopefully at a local school, uh, sometimes those parents or guardians don't show up or they're not on time. And as we know in behavioral health, those appointments tend to be pretty long and you have to be on time for those so that we can move them through, um, you know, we can move through one appointment and then get to the second appointment on time, especially as we're connecting to different locations. And certainly there's always the challenge with not enough appointments to meet the demand, yet uh, we have a lot of no-shows. So it's really trying to balance that and reduce the no-shows so that we can maximize the use of the available time of our provider. So looking at overall school-based health implementation and some of the lessons that we learned. Again, we were equipping providers with laptops or computers, but they had those anyway. They were already utilizing them for their own work. Um, the changes really around the medical side when we were looking at Tido Care. Tido Care, the equipment or the, the connection happens, they had to have Google Chrome. Uh, so that wasn't super challenging. On the patient side, we were using iPads, so we did have to get that equipment. Uh, again, we wanted to make sure that we had everything uh, up to date, uh, figured out how uh, we were keeping uh, all those, those pieces of equipment up to date, making sure that they were connected to the network, uh, getting our security updates and, and any software updates as required. So there was some process behind that, but in terms of, of the equipment, there just wasn't a lot of new stuff except for the, the fact that the Tido Care. So we needed to make sure that they had the device, the Tido Care device. And again, on the patient side, we were getting a, an iPad. <clears throat> One of the challenges though for Tido Care, specifically because we were doing that exam portion and the provider really needed a good connection or the student actually needed a good connection to the internet so that the provider could hear and see so they were getting crisp audio, crisp video. We found that the existing Wi-Fi in some of our schools just wasn't enough. And so to overcome that, we worked with our IT staff to get MiFi devices. So this is a, a Verizon wireless, uh, basically a mobile hotspot, so that they could have that additional hotspot, make sure they could connect that to the Tido Care device so that they had a very boosted signal. Even with the MiFi's though, we had to be careful of where those were located and make sure that we weren't, again, in one of those closed in interior rooms because that hotspot, if it can't get signal, it's not gonna do any, any good. So that really led into the workflow dress rehearsals. It was critical for us to do a workflow dress rehearsal in every location. So yes, we knew what the workflow was in terms of what was supposed to happen, but really testing it out in each location was critical to determine if any adjustments, adjustments needed to be made or if in fact all of our technology would work as intended. And there were definitely some delays as we had to work through some of those technology challenges in a couple of our schools that had just really, really old infrastructure and or the clinic was located in an interior area that just became very challenging for us to make sure we could get enough signal to be able to do that audio, video, and the exams as needed. And then, our providers, training them to deliver care via telemedicine, as well as use and troubleshoot the technology. So we had some clinicians who were fantastic at what they, had, what they did. They were fantastic with our students. They loved school-based health, but they claimed, in fact, that they were not techie people. 
which is completely fine. And, and we certainly had some, some folks who were very afraid of the technology. Once we walked them through as part of that dress rehearsal and showed them how relatively easy the equipment was and how it was relatively easy to utilize, um, then came the troubleshooting part, like, well, what happens if? And as anybody who's dealt with anything in IT knows, one of the very first and best ways to solve about 90% of the problems is turning it off and turning it back on again. So just getting providers comfortable with that idea of, did you turn it off and turn it back on again and restart everything, uh, you know, just getting them comfortable with that idea was, was a little bit of a challenge, but once we got them over that hump, they, they realized, oh, okay, this isn't really terrible. Additionally, our service desk has a huge knowledge base ready and, and available so they can call, not only they tend to call us on the, the virtual care team, but they can also call our help desk or our centralized service desk to get assistance. And most of the time they can get walked through those issues as well. We haven't seen a whole lot of issues. Again, a lot of it was really around connectivity. So educating those staff on scheduling the virtual visits, that was the additional challenge as well. So in many cases, we were actually doing what's called an advanced visit type. So the provider would have a patient on their schedule, but in the home clinic, especially if we were talking about behavioral health, for example, there would be time held on that, that psychiatrist schedule, but then there would also be time held on the clinic schedule so that when the student presented, they would know, oh yes, yeah, Susie is here for her behavioral health visit. And then the clinician knows, oh yeah, Susie's here for their behavioral health visit. It was one check-in, but it was just some additional build in terms of the electronic medical record system to make sure that we were holding time both on the provider schedule and in the clinic, and that we weren't overbooking our provider time. Same thing goes for the NPs. We were having sort of this two-sided visit where we had a resource in the school for that clinic side or that clinic schedule, and then the the NP had the time on their schedule. They knew who they were seeing and at what location. We were also, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, looking at opportunities to do video visits or direct to consumer visits where the students would have visits outside of school. So we were thinking really in terms of uh, summertime and when students maybe went away to college within the state that they would be able to follow up with their therapist uh, for some check-in visits as appropriate even beyond high school. So there was this commitment to keeping in touch with our students over those summer months and really as they graduated and moved through those first couple of years of college and to bridge any care, any care gaps and make sure that they had that continuity of care, especially in behavioral health. So we were already looking at mobile video visits or direct to consumer visits prior to COVID. Obviously, now that the schools are shut down, that became huge and sometimes uh, the best option, I guess, for connecting with our students. We definitely had some challenges there, which we'll talk about in a minute. So adjustments to the program and communications to patients have been made uh, on, based on feedback that we've gotten. So we've gotten patient feedback, we've gotten caregiver feedback, we've gotten clinician feedback and lessons learned. So we've kind of tweaked the process over time to make it as user-friendly as possible. Where it's appropriate, we're getting materials in the hands of those patients who are connecting on their own. So we're, we're always looking at ways to improve the process and to make that workflow as easy as possible and allow our clinicians to see as many patients as possible. Again, from a patient standpoint, this is radically convenient. It reduces time off school. It hopefully makes things easier for the parents to get to the school when they need to. And, and again, getting uh, their students care when the parent doesn't need to be present. And there is quick access to that quick and routine uh, care that those students might need in both behavioral health and primary care. From a provider or administrator standpoint, if we can keep students healthy and keep them in school and reduce the time away from school, obviously that's incredibly important, especially if we can increase their compliance with care and it reduces future illnesses and future larger issues that, that might keep them out longer. And as a health system, obviously it's important. We can increase uh, access to care and allow growth of our system and hopefully enlarge the footprint of our organization 
But again, we're definitely committed to that community care. And this is a great way that we can be in the schools and provide that care. Not going to read this parent appreciation letter, but this is just an example of a parent who is thanking the clinic for getting their, their student, a six-year-old, into a behavioral health setting because they were, you know, getting in trouble all the time. They were getting suspended. They weren't able to concentrate in class. And they knew that getting care outside this clinic setting was going to be very difficult. The, the son was diagnosed with ADHD. They were able to get them on some therapy and some medication. And basically they graduated kindergarten on their way to first grade and no problems from that point on. So it was a really huge change for the student and, and really setting them up for success that early on is super important because then they're going to have a much better experience as they move through their K through 12 journey. Some keys to success. This is pretty, pretty easy, basic stuff, but just it, it does need to be said. If we're going to do this virtually, it's got to work seamlessly for both the patient and the provider. If it's not easy, then people aren't going to want to do it. Uh, obviously, in, in the world we live in, sometimes virtual is the only way or the best way to do it. But prior to, to this COVID crisis, uh, there was definitely some reluctance. Providing education and support to both providers and patients, super important as well. So part of that working seamlessly, we have to give patients and providers what to expect and a comfort level with that. And then people skills, super, super important that just because we're delivering it over video, we can't lose that personal touch and to make sure that that everybody's comfortable and that we're still making a connection even though it's on video. So important things like making patients feel like they're important, that they're being listened to and that they're being seen by making eye contact and where is the camera, all those, all those types of website manner types of things we wanted to take into consideration. So again, people skills, connecting with patients, super, super important. We did have some online refresher training available to our staff. Uh, and also the availability to train new staff. And again, we are always looking to check in with our programs to make sure that things are, are moving along and that there's not additional support that they need or improvements that need to be made to the program. So prior to COVID, some of the obstacles and barriers were things like resources for growth and provider adoption and patient adoption. In light of the pandemic and stay at home orders, those things became much less important as a lot of people were diving into virtual care options. So we're still running into things like regulation, uh, state licensure. When we have those students going off to college, are we able to see them if they're in another state? Well, again, prior to COVID, that was not something that was easy to do. Um, and we have a whole webinar, and I know Becky's talked about it in the past about regulation and, and licensure and and all those things. And then technology. Um, technology actually has somewhat become a bigger issue because of students moving away from those, those school settings and now they're out on their own. And so what does that do to our students getting access to care? So just a couple slides to talk about specifically what this, the response has been during this pandemic. So with schools out, how do we maintain services? Well, just like our traditional outpatient clinics, we were looking to move as much as possible to video visits. And so we're looking to adopt those for both the medical and behavioral health services. But what do we lose? Well, we lose that exam enabled portion because these students don't have that Tido care device. And the biggest kind of aha moment for our clinicians was that we really needed to look at non-traditional hours because now that students were not coming to school at a specific time, parents and patients, well, they weren't getting up at the same time that they would normally get up for school. They were finding that some patients don't even call them before noon or one o'clock in the afternoon because they're not awake. So that was, that was a very interesting shift that our staff had to take. The biggest barrier was that children didn't have access to a device or if they had access to a device, they didn't necessarily have an internet connection to allow them to connect to a video visit. So in, in the clinician's minds, okay, well, they don't have a device, we can't do video, we'll, def we'll defer to audio only. Well, even in some of these households, they had very limited access even to phone service because some of those families were using a government-issued phone that was a prepaid per minute 
per month kind of a contract. And so if you're thinking about a 30 or a 60 minute behavioral health phone call, that's eating up a lot of minutes. And in some cases, they only had one phone in the house. And then of course, privacy, where in the home can they go to have this private conversation or this private visit that became difficult when you have lots of people in a house, there's no place for that, that person to go, uh, that teen or, or younger adult to go and actually have that visit. So part of that response and part of the things that the clinicians realized that they needed to do is make sure that we had staff to assist families applying for free and reduced cost internet services. And then how do we get devices into the hands of our students? So they're looking at opportunities for grant funding to get devices like an iPad for use in homes with those, those recurring students or those, those students that they have the established relationship with maybe as a loan or again, looking at ways to get other sources of getting a device into those hands so that, um, that we can see that. As the school clinics start opening up, so even though the schools haven't opened up, we're looking uh, in the next week or two to open up some of those clinics, looking at opportunities to maintain social distancing. They're actually looking at the opportunity to do a video visit basically, while the student and or student and family are in their car in a parking lot so we're going to bring out an iPad, do the video visit, make sure that we have connection, uh, a Wi-Fi connection, and maybe using those MiFi devices, and do the exam in a car or in a parking lot. So we're not bringing them in closed setting in a clinic, but we're able to still provide that care. Uh, again, uh, we're always looking at funding, and so the school-based health program has gotten some additional funding to address some of the social and emotional needs in response to the COVID-19 crisis, and there's some really cool programs that they're looking at around that, that grant funding in terms of support for those families, in addition to, um, you know, not just that, that conversation or that support or that therapy, but really what are the things in the home that they need? Is it groceries? Is it uh, you know, is it help with um, maybe that internet? So a lot of different things they're looking at in, in, in terms of how they're going to use that funding. Down the road and as we're kind of prepping for that next wave <clears throat> of COVID, um, schools are also going to become a community testing site because again, those, those places where we have the clinics, we have clinicians. And so we're looking at opportunities to use those as the community testing sites as we move forward. And when I asked the clinicians what, what were the good things that came out of it, and they said that the opportunity really that came out of this is they, they are thinking very creatively, uh, not only out of the box, but out of the building and how care can be delivered. And then uh, virtual and creative care models will really, they envision continuing and evolving past the crisis as we think about opportunities to, to have that ongoing care for our school-based population. And I just wanna share this quote from Dr. Connolly when when we asked specifically about COVID-19 and really in light of the protests that have been going on across the country, um, she responded by saying the foundation of school-based care is to address health disparities related to race, ethnicity, economic status, gender, and sexual orientation. The movement for racial justice and the demand that Black Lives Matter is integral to what we do in school-based health and highlights the urgency of our work. So I thought that was a really great quote, wanted to share that with you. Virtual care really enables us to offer better and connected access to healthcare, meet, up, meet patient expectations for online services, reduce costs, uh, really even in terms of time and travel, and then increase that clinician efficiency where we can utilize those very scarce resources and spread that across a multiple clinics uh, in a diverse area. So we really wanna connect with customers where, when, and how they wanna be reached. And that's part of our all for you promise to our to our uh, community. So with that, I will pause and see if there are any questions or anything that came up during, during the webinar or any, any additional thoughts, maybe Becky, that you have. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Marie. I, I love school-based programs. They are very near and dear to my heart. I'm very passionate about them. Um, the first question that we've got for you is how are, or are you able to video conference in parents having three-way calls for the visits? So we are, the, the current video 
platform that we were utilizing for our video visits. We were using Video VIDYO and we were deep integrated with Epic. That did not allow us to do three-way calling with either parents or with interpreter services, which became very challenging. So we're looking shortly to transition to context aware linking with our video vendor, VIDYO. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, we have also started adopting other platforms like WebEx where we can do that. So we're not integrated with Epic in that case but we are able to utilize WebEx. So again, in the past, it hadn't been as important because we wanted the parents to come directly to the school when we were doing those psychiatry visits and we didn't need the parent necessarily for those medical visits. So we're in kind of new territory, uh, but we're definitely moving toward that because we know that that's important, not only for, again, interpreter services, but to have parents involved. And again, hopefully increase the convenience for, for parents for sure. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about reimbursement and reimbursing. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I've got, so I've got my own questions just because I'm so passionate about this topic. Um, but for all of you um, out there in the audience, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A function and ask questions. We've got a few more minutes um, that we've got uh, Marie and uh, we'll see what we can get answered. So for reimbursement, um, so you mentioned that you guys do bill insurance when the child does have insurance. Um, are you, have you gotten any pushback from Michigan Medicaid or private payers in Michigan? Not to my, uh, as far as covering. Re covering the services, yeah. Yeah, um, again, prior to COVID, if, if it wasn't a service that we would, that that didn't cover virtual care then we wouldn't we wouldn't push through the um we wouldn't push through the service so um and that's probably uh for the our program directors to answer more directly because they're again their billing was really their their billing is really unique uh and tracked very differently from the rest of the health system mm -hmm. yeah do you know if the um michigan medicaid is allowing or private payer for that matter, the Q3014 to be billed by schools. I don't remember if I've seen that in Michigan Medicaid. Um, and, and refresh me or specifically, is that a- Oh, so the Q3014 is the uh, originating site facility. Ah. Fee. We've been pushing here in Indiana, and I think mm -hmm. Georgia no. allows it. Um, and I know it's not a lot. It's like 15 to $20 yeah. per visit. Right. As a health system, again, prior to COVID, as a health system, we were not, we just opted out of that facility fee because it was, it was more, more of a problem than, a, than the benefit of getting that. Although as, as the COVID crisis has come around, we know that there's definitely some split billing and, and that, that code is being, uh, is being covered. So we're re-examining how we're doing our codes right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the program that on my IRHA hat uh, that we're running, mm -hmm. you know, we see it as an opportunity for the schools to get some type of reimbursement for the nurses having to wear this additional hat yes. and support um, an additional staff person for the school-based program. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's see. And, and you may have addressed this. I, I, if you did, I missed it. Um, in the school, in, in, in all of the schools, do any of the schools allow the employees to be seen? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. You know, I don't know that I've ever specifically asked that question. My, my gut is that yes, but I, I don't know for sure. Uh, I mean, it's, it's functionally a, a Henry Ford clinic. Uh, we have the electronic medical record system. Obviously, the providers are very pediatric specific. So I'm not sure if, if there is sort of an adult coverage. I would assume in an emergency, obviously, they would be seen, but um, probably not for routine care. But as we shift with the, with the COVID crisis, and as we're looking at these becoming testing centers, I would imagine that there could be an opportunity, um, not only for staff, but for community adults to be seen in these clinics as well. So I know that there is definitely um, a view into that or, or sort of a, that's on the radar. Yeah. I'm also very excited to hear that you guys were able to continue to provide that service to kiddos at home. That's so important. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, obviously, it's not ideal, uh, especially in situations where we can't even get video, but uh, it's, it's definitely challenges that we're, we're looking at overcoming. <laughs> Um, in, and then in Michigan, the, um, do you guys ever use navigators to try and get the kiddos signed up for some type of a Medicaid program? Yeah, yeah, we've got, um, we, we definitely, our health system has uh, financial navigators that do that assistance for sure. Great. Um, and then some questions um, I love, and I know being, having previously been inside a school-based program and being more involved in the nuts and bolts of it, how important it is to get the uh, the parents involved and to do those um, back to school events and and talk to them, you know, multiple, multiple, multiple times. Um, how, I, and I, I don't remember from your presentation, how many years have you guys been doing school based health? Oh, gosh, um, school based health has, uh, I mean, certainly before virtual care got involved. Uh, so some of the data goes back as far as 2012 that I had in the presentation, okay. but honestly, it's, it's probably a little bit further than that. I, I would have mm -hmm. to find out specifically, yeah. but it's, it's been several years and it's certainly, they were around well before virtual care got involved with the program. Right, right. Um, and then I would assume if you'd look back at the numbers, um, you'd see exponential growth from the first couple of years. Sure thing, yeah. We started out just in a couple of schools and uh, even over the last, I want to say, year or so, we're looking uh, and then moving forward. We had added four additional clinics last year, and I think that there are an additional four slated for a little bit later this year. So it's definitely, there's a lot of interest. Um, the state of Michigan, I think, had put out uh, a grant that they wanted to fund clinics in about 50 additional schools. So Henry Ford was looking at the opportunity to, to grab several of those and, and set up a clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned when you talked about the benefits, um, have you guys been able to do any analysis on um, rise in attendance uh, for kids or decrease in emergency room department visits in the area of the schools? Yeah, that's a great question. I would have to get back with you on that and talk with the, the program administrators on that. I, I would assume that there's, that's probably part of their grant funding that they have to do some of that reporting. Um, and, and I know that uh, just, just in, in Detroit specifically, there's a huge, um, a huge population of students who have asthma. And I know that I, I kind of keep throwing that one out as, as sort of a key, but that, that really is such a key. Um, for, for a lot of students where if it's not controlled, that's where we're seeing a lot of emergency room visits. And the more that we can get those students that routine care and just learning how to use their inhaler, um, that's, been, that's been incredibly helpful in reducing those emergency room visits. Very cool. Um, have you, and I don't remember off the top of my head, the different Medicaid contracted entities in the state of Michigan, but has Henry Ford reached out to them to provide any educational information to students and parents? Uh, uh, regarding the school-based health or? Um, just regarding nutrition or, yes, it's a good thing to have an annual health visit and go see your eye doctor every, every year. Right, right. Yeah, I think I think all that is part of part of the program, certainly in uh, in in making sure that those students have that awareness and that well, the families, I guess, have that awareness for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know um, we've seen in other programs just a, a lack of health literacy. Uh, ah, yes, especially when dealing with populations um, that are facing a lot of social determinants of health. Yep. Um, and then, oh, my last question for you, and nobody else has any questions, I've got tons. Um, <laughs> my last question for you is about the integration between TIDO and the link to the EHR. Um, how is that done? It's not. <laughs> so that's okay. the short answer. None. Um, it's, it's, uh, so we're using TIDO care cur currently completely independent of the EHR. So the information that functionally is entered into the cloud for TIDO care uh, the clinician is then entering it into e the EHR 
manually as if they were seeing a patient, as if they were sitting side by side with the patient. So they're getting that information from, from Title Care. Future, we're looking at that, the integration. So again, as we move with our video platform from our current deep integration to contextware linking, we'll be looking at opportunities that'll, that'll give us the opportunity to uh, more directly link Tito Care with, uh, with Epic mm -hmm. in our case. Yeah. Um, we have a question about alternatives to Tito Care. Okay. Um, are you aware of any alternatives? Oh, lots. Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of uh, of items out on the market. I I don't know that I could tell them to you off the top of my head, but I know um, I, I know initially we had oh, and I can't remember the name of it. I'm kind of putting me on the spot here. Um, we had a cart, um, an AMD cart, I think it was. AMD was the company, and it was like twenty thousand dollars or twenty four thousand dollars. It was this incredibly expensive cart that had all of the the exams um it was a little bit clunky the technology was not super uh, user friendly and it ended up getting collecting dust because it just wasn't easy to use um since then of course there's there's been lots of different um things out on the market that allow that exam enabled um, our home base our home monitoring uh, ex, uh group uses a company called uh hra and then I think prior to that, they were using Philips and it, it gave some of the same things, but not exactly the same thing. So as a health system, we were already utilizing TitoCare for a couple of different programs. So this is the one that just really made sense for us. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely others out on the, on, out on the market. Yeah. Um, so, and this person again is uh, talking about TitoCare. Mm -hmm. um, I know, and, and I was going to mention this actually, um, you can go to Best Buy and get the consumer version of Tidal mm -hmm. Care for $299. What's the price for the Pro Care? Yeah, the Pro is about $1,000. And there's some licensing fees around that too. Um, and we have a we have more of a corporate contract, but it's uh, the, the functional device is 1000 for the kit. But then additionally, we found that we want to order an iPad to go with that. So it's another $400 or whatever it is. So um, it's under $2,000, I would say, for kind of the whole, the whole package on the patient side. And then from the provider side, really, they're just, they're just connecting via a, a Google Chrome browser. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Before we close out, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to the chat box. Um, we have put a survey in. If you would please answer that survey, it's just a couple of questions for our um, for us to report back to our funders and give some um, feedback to Marie on her presentation today. So, um, unless there's any last minute questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up. And Marie, again, thank you so much for um, coming and speaking to the group today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, and I hope everybody found some value. Thanks. Yeah.